Just to give an outline of the presentation, I will more or less give a background of the project, the importance of cocoa to Trinidad and Tobago, understanding frosty pod rot, and some of the activities of the project activities, training of the Trinidad and Tobago staff in Costa Rica, frosty pod rot surveys, pathway analysis, stakeholder workshops, training sessions, public education awareness campaign, our national emergency action plan developed for frosty pod, and then summarize the project activities with the outputs. As you're aware, the project title, Mitigating the Threat of Invasive Species in the Insular Caribbean, and our sub-project title, which is Preventing. I've underlined preventing because frosty pod rot is not, is not in Trinidad and Tobago, so preventing the entry of the fungus, frosty pod rot, of cocoa into Trinidad and Tobago. I'd like to highlight the team leaders for this project, Mr. Asim Dilbar, who's a project leader for 2010 to 2012. He's not here today, and I've assumed or inherited this particular project from September 2013. So just to give a, a background, the start date, April 2010, the end date, March 2014, the implementing agency, the lead agency, Ministry of Food Production, the research division in collaboration with other divisions of the Ministry of Food Production, Tobago House of Assembly, Cocoa and Coffee Industry Board, UE, Cocoa Research Center, farmers and other stakeholders. Okay, so the main objectives of this project, the project is aimed at protecting the cocoa growing areas in Trinidad and Tobago from frosty pod rot through strengthening of the detection and interception of the disease at the various points of entry, the establishment of systems and protocols for the speedy eradication of the disease if detected, and the continuous monitoring of the ports of entry and cocoa growing areas for the presence of the disease. This project has been very timely because the disease is present in Venezuela and thus poses a serious threat to Trinidad and Tobago and other Caribbean countries. The disease can reduce crop yield by 70 to 80 percent, and we'll get into that in the, later in the presentation. And it will affect the islands and Trinidad and Tobago in particular because it's world renowned for its fine or flavored cocoa. And given the increase in movement of persons and materials, both intentionally and unintentionally, as well as the extensive damage this disease causes, it is important that measures be put in place to both prevent the entry of the disease as well as to successfully manage it should it be detected in Trinidad and Tobago. So frosty pod rot and other diseases of economic importance, I'll just touch on it. You have black pod, which is broom, which is here, and frosty pod rot, which is not reported in Trinidad and Tobago. This is what it looks like, frosty pod rot, the early symptoms, and advanced frosty pod rot. Where is frosty pod rot found? And this uh, table just um, advances frosty pod rot through Latin America. You could see from Colombia, 1851, right through to Bolivia in 2012. The red colored area shows where frosty pod rot is found and the area that's circle in uh, purple shows Trinidad just at the end there of Venezuela. So hence there's a concern because frosty pod rot is in Venezuela, and there's a possibility that the pathogen could move from Venezuela into Trinidad and Tobago. The economic importance of frosty pod rot in tropical America, and we look through this in terms of actually putting emphasis as to why we need to take steps to prevent the entry of this disease into Trinidad and Tobago. So thousands of cocoa plantations have been abandoned during the period 1882 to 2005, and you could see Colombia, Ecuador, Venezuela, Costa Rica, Peru, Honduras, Mexico. The comparative importance, and we look in terms of the lit literature where you see frosty pod rot is twice as dis dis destructive as phytophthora disease as reported. It is more dangerous and difficult to control than which is broom. In Colombia, where frosty pod rot and witch's broom are widely distributed, frosty pod rot was and continues to be the most limiting disease. And where frosty pod rot appeared in Peru in 1987, it rapidly became the paramount problem displacing witch's broom disease from this position. 
So the importance of cocoa to Trinidad and Tobago and the importance, how important cocoa, it is, cocoa is to Trinidad and Tobago, and again, with emphasis as to why we need to prevent this disease from entering. Just to give a glimpse into Trinidad and Tobago's cocoa industry, there are about 1,800 farmers cultivating about 4,000 hectares of land, and over 95% is exported to Europe, Japan, and the US. And it is based on our flavor attributes for single origin chocolates and blending. The world cocoa market distinguishes between two broad categories of cocoa beans, final flavor cocoa beans and bulk or ordinary cocoa beans. Trinidad and Tobago is known in the cocoa trade as fine or flavor cocoa and is characterized by a full cocoa flavor with pleasant flavors such as molasses, caramel, and raisin. And cocoa is one of the export commodities that contribute to foreign exchange earnings in the agricultural sector. Trinidad and Tobago produces approximately 600 metric tons of superior fine or flavor cocoa which commands a premium price on the international market and it consistently attracts uh, the highest world price of US 5,000 per metric ton. The number of persons employed in the industry is approximately 2,000, 2,005. So this again, should the disease enter, it will have implication in terms of the impact in the industry. And we're saying if approximately 600 uh, metric tons is produced, the export value price at 5,000 US per metric ton we have about 3 million US in foreign exchange. And this bean value is multiplied by a factor of approximately 30 by chocolatiers to give a value of 90 million US in value added, which takes place overseas. Locally, there are about 20 entrepreneurs who process beans into drinking chocolates and other products. And this table just shows final flavor cocoa producing countries and countries designated 100%, you would see Trinidad and Tobago as one of the countries, including some of the other countries in the region. And in terms of the percentage of production of final flavor, uh, the column on the right indicates that percentage. So the Trinidad and Tobago flavor reputation have resulted from the Trinitario varieties, their processing methods, the soils and the climate, it's a combination. And based on the participation in the Cocoa of Excellence Awards, Paris, from 20, 2009 to 2011, Trinidad and Tobago won in six of the same of, of the seven flavor categories. Fruity, floral, nutty, spicy, sweetness, cocoa flavor, and Trinidad and Tobago won the global quality in 2013. This is just uh, the webpage from Cocoa of Excellence, and you will see here on the webpage, Trinidad and Tobago, La Reunion Estate, as being one of the winners in 2013. Trinidad Tobago cocoa has a potential value for added products. There's a range of potential value added products can, that can be made from cocoa, and this can significantly increase the income generating capacity of the industry. We also have the International Cocoa Gene Bank located in Trinidad. It's situated at the University Cocoa Research Station, La Reunion Estate. And currently, there are approximately 2,300 types of accessions represented by about 12,000 trees. And additional clones have become available. So should Frosty Pod Rot enter, definitely it's a threat to cocoa and the ICGB. The impact, there are a number of, uh, there's environmental impact, social impact, economic. Uh, for example, you have the Tobago Cocoa Estate, which is an ecotourism resort where there's a, it's used as a heritage park with watching where visitors can learn about the history of cocoa. And cocoa beans there are also exported and made into premium chocolate bars. You also have the Asa Wright Nature Center, which is a form of cocoa and coffee plantation, which is used as an area, some amount of cocoa is still produced and is used uh, for a wide range of bird species, which inhabit the area and attracts a lot of tourists in terms of bird watching. So just to get a glimpse into frosty pod rot, what is frosty pod rot? <coughs> There's an invasive disease caused by this fungus. It only affects the actively growing pod tissue. The young pods are more susceptible to infection 
and there's a one to three month lag between infection and appearance of symptoms. And it's important to understand the symptomology, the life cycle of the disease, so that you can better manage this particular um, problem. So again, just to give a glimpse into the symptoms, you have deformation and swellings, internal discoloration, as you can see here, uh, dark brown to black colored lesions, discoloration or uneven and premature ripening, sporulation, and then at the advanced stage, you have mummification. This again is a life cycle, which is important, which we not get into here, but important in understanding the particular disease and what you would have to work with. Disease management in terms of, uh, we would look at regulatory control or the plant quarantine um, issues, the cultural control measures, biological control, chemical control, and breeding for tolerance. I've inserted a slide here of breeding because currently the Ministry of Food Production is involved in a breeding program, breeding for tolerant varieties, in collaboration with a number of international organizations. So moving on to some of the other activities in the project, training of the Trinidad Tobago staff in Costa Rica, which is one of the project activities. Training in Costa Rica, nine participants from Trinidad um, visited Costa Rica, which included participants from the Ministry of Food Production, Cocoa and Coffee Industry Board, and University of the West Indies. And this training took place in October 2010. The key facilitator was a consultant from CABI, and here you have the consultant together with some of the participants from Trinidad and Tobago. The objectives of this training in uh, Costa Rica was more or less to be participate in a training of trainers program. Training in field and laboratory identification of frosty ball rot. So therefore we have built the capacity for this particular disease. Training of all stakeholders in Trinidad and Tobago by the trained personnel that is on their return to Trinidad to conduct rapid baseline survey to confirm that frosty pod rot is not already present in Trinidad and Tobago, to develop a technical package, a survey protocol, and to raise public awareness. This is, uh, shows some shots uh, during the training in Costa Rica, uh, participants during field observation and collection of disease pods, examination of these pods, and laboratory examination. One of the activities also involved with the technical team was to develop a technical package and a survey protocol. And this is done uh, by the team. So here you have the training manual, what it looks like, the contents of the training manual, which is a very comprehensive document. Uh, we then conducted the first survey and the second survey. Survey kits were provided for each of the survey teams. Uh, random sampling of the cocoa farms in eight of the counties from <coughs> Trinidad and Tobago where the survey was conducted. Uh, in Trinidad and Tobago in 2010 and in 2013, 2014, you have two surveys being conducted. Participation from the regions in North and South. Uh, this slide more or less shows um, the survey where in each farm, 20 plants were examined and the su suspected pods were then taken to the lab for any, if there were any suspected pods for verification, this is what the form looks like. I'm speeding up because in the interest of time. Survey data was collected in a number of areas which could inform further um, activities with respect to the cocoa industry. And in 2010, at the end of the survey, this is the mapping of the farms using the GPS handheld units that was used. No symptoms of frosty pod rot were observed during this particular survey. A poster was um, developed for the first survey, and this is what it looks like. And the second survey, which was conducted in November to December 2013, February 2014. Data again, the farm survey throughout the island, the farm size, the percentage of farms, active and non-active farms, the source of planting material, and the cultivars and plant disease, and fortunately, again, you will see frosty pod rot was not found. So no symptoms were found during the survey 2013-2014 in Trinidad and Tobago. This shows the farms, uh, St. Patrick West, and I have highlighted this because during our work sessions, it was indicated that there was need to survey these high-risk areas and the coastal areas, which is this area, which is closest to Venezuela. This shows the mapping for Tobago. The survey team for Tobago out in the field 
and in Trinidad, and a pathway analysis was also conducted. The pathway analysis was initiated on behalf of the project to analyze the possible means and pathways for the entry of the frosty pot rot um, organism. The key findings, natural dispersal to Trinidad and Tobago from infected areas in Venezuela by wind and water is highly unlikely. Increase in trade and visitor traffic between the infected countries will increase the likelihood of the accidental intro introduction of frosty pot rot. And there's an unrecorded and unregulated, unquantifiable entries and exits by persons and goods arriving from Venezuela locations other than the official ports of entry. So the risk of introduction in these areas is very high. So therefore, there's a need to strengthen the quarantine measures. You also need to look at your tourist sites, your tourist destinations, and ecotourism sites. A number of sessions, sensitization and training workshops were held, uh, training a workshop to sensitize all stakeholders. This slide here shows the activities during that particular training workshop. With 55 persons, a wide cross-section of stakeholders participated. And there were some outcomes from the workshop discussions in terms of surveillance, monitoring, training, and public awareness should be ongoing activities. Quarantine should be addressed, public awareness, and monitoring regular updates on the situation in Venezuela. Again, training and ICM and biocontrol measures should be looked at. It should be a network with Ecuador, Peru, and other agencies. Breeding and genetics initiate breeding programs with CRC using molecular tools, and this has already been initiated. Training, this particular training was done to train staff throughout the island in the conduct of the survey. And again, it was just to familiarize with frosty pod rot disease and the survey protocol. The output for 45 persons were trained island-wide, and survey teams developed. This just shows, captures the training sessions, uh, training in the field, and Tobago also workshop and training activities, where 35 persons participated. This activity here shows field training in Tobago. Public education awareness campaign was also conducted, and brochures, uh, pest alerts, flyers were distributed island-wide throughout all the agencies. This shows the pest alert that was distributed, the brochure, and a poster. A hotline was also developed, um, put in place actually, and this hotline number has been identified in both the pest alert flyer and brochure, so that persons could quickly call in should there be any suspicious symptoms to report. A national emergency action plan was also developed. This shows the participants at the National Emergency Action Plan workshop. Uh, group discussions during that uh, workshop sessions. And the emergency action plan was designed, to, was designed so that it could outline an organized approach to prevent the introduction of frosty pod rot into Trinidad and Tobago. And there's a structure that is developed. The draft is already prepared and it's just been finalized where you have a national emergency Response Committee, a National Emergency Task Force, and a Regional Control Center. So that about more or less concludes the presentation. And just to summarize the activities, with regards to the project activities, the survey was completed, training of trainers in Costa Rica completed, the training of all stakeholders by officers on the return to, from Costa Rica was completed, Pathway analysis report completed. Development of the National Action Plan, the draft is prepared and it's just been finalized. The establishment of a hotline completed. Public education and awareness of campaign completed. The set up and implement systems for continuous monitoring and surveillance is ongoing. And we heard this morning from the welcome, from the remarks from the director of research, there's a cabinet appointed committee dealing with IAS. So this will take the process forward. So to conclu conclude, the prevention of FBR from invading the cocoa resources of the Caribbean is of critical importance to the economic well-being and biodiversity of Trinidad and Tobago and the rest of the Caribbean. We, so we need to keep frosty pod rot out of Trinidad and Tobago and the region. There are many persons that acknowledge the director of research, the deputy director, the staff of the crop protection uh, subdivision, research division, Mr. Kamali Mirage, Mr. Asim Dilbar, the former team leader, uh, the staff of the library services providing a lot of information for us at short notice. The Jeff National and Regional Coordinator, all the subdivisions, all the divisions of the Ministry of Food Production, Tobago House of Assembly, 
collaborators, funding agencies, and many others, and support and use of the slides and photos for this presentation. I thank you.